Hey, my third grade friends, it's Mrs. Real here. I have a new book to start with you today. But before we start on this chapter book, um, I wanna to touch base again. We, the last couple of videos, we've done some human body things, and I was highly encouraging you to look into a lot, of, a lot more things that you can find to learn about all of the different systems in the human body. It's so intensely complicated and fun, and just there's lots of things to do. So. Um, in looking for activities, I Googled human body activities for third grade and came up with lots of things. Once you get past the stuff for sale, there's lots of activities on Pinterest. There's lots of things. There was one third grade teacher who had this great list of different websites you could go to, which I sent to your teachers. But when I started looking at, into the activities, the links were so old that they weren't going there anymore. But there's still a lot out there. So I'm highly encouraging you with your grownups at home, if you have time and haven't spent 8 million years on your computer already and nobody else needs it for work, do some checking into some of those great activities because maybe as I was going through it really quickly, you're like, oh, all those different things on your tongue that you can taste salty and sour and sweet. I want to know more about that. Or maybe you were the one who was like, oh, that heart is pumping blood and there's arteries and veins and there's a different system. There's all kinds of things. Or maybe your nerves or your bones. Maybe Cinderella skeleton was your fun thing and you want to write poems about it. All of that stuff is really cool. So I hope you check into those things more. But for now, for our next few lessons, I have a chapter book to share with you. Now, this is a book that I found a while ago, um, a year ago, at the last Tucson Festival of Books where we got to go. Um, this author was there and I got that book then. It's a chapter book. So I have shared it with a few classes last year. I'm not sure you guys are any of them. Maybe you are. We didn't get very far into it, but I've always wanted to finish it. So I'm going to finish it. So I'm going to read to you guys a couple of chapters at a time until we finish the book. So right now I'm going to show you this book is called Samantha Spinner and the Secret Super Secret Plans by Russell Gins. Pull it down so you can see his name. So this is one that I bought at the Tucson Festival of the Books. It's in our Gale Library, <laughs> except for right now it's living in my house. But when we're back, it'll be back. So it says, get ready for a super fun adventure filled with super secret messages and super smelly danger. Samantha Spinner's Uncle Paul disappeared, and here's what he left. Sam's sister got a check for, I have to look at all the zeros in here, hundreds, thousands, millions, two billion, four hundred million dollars. Two billion, four hundred million dollars. Sam's brother Nipper got the New York Yankees. It's the baseball team, the real life one. And Sam got a trusty red umbrella with a tag hanging off its worn handle that says, watch out for the rain. Notice rain in capital letters. Thanks a lot, Uncle Paul. Her sister gets $2,400,000,000. Her brother gets a baseball team and she gets a rusty red umbrella with a tag that says, watch out for the rain. But if Uncle Paul taught Sam anything, it's that not everything is exactly what it seems. And one thing's for sure, the rain is coming. And Sam and her brother are about to find themselves mixed up in some super important, super dangerous, super secret plans. Okay, and the exciting thing that I just noticed is right here, if we finish this one and you love it, there is a Samantha Spinner part two. So I'm going to set my timer right now. I'm going to read this to you for about 20 minutes. Stop at whatever chapter we can around then. Um, I'm going to put it up here under the document camera, even though there's typically not many pictures. That's okay. You can follow along with me. I can read on the screen. And here it says the Eiffel Tower. The Eiffel Tower stands in the heart of Paris, France. Built for a World's Fair, it was completed in 1889. At 1,063 feet tall, it's the tallest building in the city. For more than 40 years, it was the tallest building in the world. I don't know what that has to do with our story, but here it is. Every year, Millions of visitors ride the elevator to the top and gaze upon the beautiful city of Paris. The tower is made out of huge iron beams 
connected by metal fasteners called rivets. There are more than 2.5 million rivets holding the massive structure together. So not nails and not screws, they're just more like metal things that go in and they squish them and they hold everything together. One of the rivets isn't a rivet at all, but a button. Look for it two feet up on a large support beam at the northeast corner of the first platform. It stands out from the other rivets because it is shiny silver and not painted brown. Press it and you'll hear a soft low hum. After 60 seconds, a hatch will open, revealing a ladder stretching the length of the support beam. Enter and descend. The pull of air will become stronger as you climb down. You may let go at any time. Before you hit the ground, you'll be sucked into a pneumatic tube. What? I don't know if that's true or not. A pneumatic tube is if you've ever gone with your grown-ups to the bank and you go through the drive through and you put that little cylinder in and you push the button to send it and it goes and it gets sucked up through the tube into the bank and then the bank lady or man sends it back out to your car and it gets popped down and then the door opens. It's using air suction to get it from one place to the other. That's what a pneumatic tube is. So if you start going down and let go of the ladder, you get sucked into a tube before you hit the bottom. Hmm. I wonder what this has to do with our story. Let's find out. Chapter one, unexplained vanishing person. Samantha went searching for Uncle Paul. Nobody had seen him for days. On Friday morning, he'd made strawberry waffles and helped everyone get ready for the day. He reminded Buffy to include her books and pencils in the large handbag she lugged to school. Then he waited for the bus with Samantha and Nipper, and he walked their pug, Dennis, to the park and back. After he dropped Dennis at home, he shuffled across the driveway in his bright orange flip-flops to his one-room apartment above the garage. That was the last anyone had seen or heard of him. When she looked for him on Saturday, Samantha figured he was at the flea market, where he traded snow globes and souvenirs every weekend. But she couldn't find him then, or on Sunday either. So on Sunday evening, she went up the stairs and peeked through his apartment door. His crates of books, magnets, stickers, and maps were stacked neatly against the wall, but there was no sign of him anywhere. On Monday morning, he didn't show up to make breakfast. That was when the whole Spinner family agreed that Uncle Paul was officially missing. Two police officers came to investigate, and Samantha's dad lent them an extra powerful flashlight. Whoops. Sorry guys, that was a different timer. They seemed a lot more interested in the experimental high candle power light bulb than anything they shined it on in Uncle Paul's apartment. They returned to the spinner's kitchen after a five minute search. We didn't see anything out of the ordinary, one of the officers told them. We can't say for certain that he's dead. Dead? All five spinners asked at the same time. Well, there's always a chance that he's alive somewhere, said the other officer. As he spoke, he picked up two apples from the kitchen counter and juggled them absentmindedly with one hand. Sometimes uncles just go missing without telling anyone, he said, and put the apples back on the counter. They promised to fill out an unexplained vanishing person form and left. Soon after that, Mrs. Spinner headed off to the North Seattle Animal Hospital, where she was director of rodent and lizard care. Mr. Spinner left for the American Institute of Lamps, where he was senior light bulb tester. And Buffy, forgetting her books and pencils, grabbed her giant handbag and walked to school. For the first time in years, Samantha and her brother Nipper waited by themselves for the bus. Of course, Samantha knew that Uncle Paul would never just go missing without telling anyone, especially her. She knew something was deeply wrong, but she had no idea what to do about a missing uncle. So when the bus pulled up, she climbed on board and went to school. That afternoon, all three kids gathered under the basketball net hanging outside their uncle's apartment. Last week, I showed Uncle Paul this new hat and this new handbag, said Buffy. She held them up as evidence for Samantha and Nipper to examine. Usually he made a joke about how I need a 550 room mansion for all my accessories, she recalled with a sigh. But he didn't tease me about, he didn't tease me at all. Maybe he knew he was doomed. Maybe he was kidnapped, said Nipper. Maybe he exploded. 
Buffy thought about that and looked around. If he did, then where are all the blown up pieces of hideous orange shoes, she asked. Samantha was pretty sure Uncle Paul hadn't exploded. Her brother and sister were exactly as helpful as she expected them to be. Not much at all. She left them standing under the basketball net and headed down the block to Volunteer Park. In the center of the park, an art museum overlooked the city, with a view of downtown Seattle and the Olympic Mountains far in the distance. Uncle Paul spent a lot of time at that museum, so Samantha hoped she might get some help from Olivia Turtle, head of museum security. When Samantha told her about Uncle Paul's disappearance, Olivia seemed worried too. Unfortunately, not for the same reasons as Samantha. So he just went missing? Olivia asked slowly. Samantha nodded. Well, I hope you find him, young lady, she said. There's a big convention here next month, and security guards are coming from all over the world. I was going to ask your uncle to be on my trivia quiz team. She adjusted her badge. Nobody knows about art and architecture like Pajama Paul, she said. It always bothered Samantha when people called her uncle Pajama Paul. True, he did walk around in green plaid pajamas and a pair of bright orange flip-flops all day, every day. She had never seen him wear anything else. But there was so much more to Paul Spinner than plaid pajamas. Every night, he would sit with Samantha and Nipper on the stairs to his apartment above the garage and tell stories about amazing places all over the world. He talked about the Great Wall of China and a mountain city called Machu Picchu. He talked about what it would have been like to travel on the Titanic. And there you can see his plaid pajamas and his orange flip-flops. He knew an awful lot about cathedrals and fountains and faraway countries, especially for someone who wore green plaid pajamas and bright orange flip-flops all day, every day. He taught Samantha how to say, please, where is the tallest building in the city? And thank you, in 11 languages. Every now and then, he'd come back from the flea market with something interesting and give it to Nipper. Last year, he'd given Nipper an old postage stamp with a picture of an upside down airplane on it. Nipper took it to school on a windy day and it blew away during recess. That's kind of a, an, a well-known expensive postage stamp. Buffy made it clear that she didn't want anything from the flea market. Nothing involving fleas of any kind was welcome in her life. Paul didn't bring items for Samantha either. Instead, he'd always bring her a story or a riddle or an amazing fact about the world. Sometimes he'd even help him, she'd even help him find things to collect and trade. Samantha spent the next several days looking for secret magnets or stickers left behind by her uncle to let her know he was all right or that he was thinking about her. She looked everywhere in the house and around the neighborhood. She found nothing. <clears throat> After a week, Samantha's parents finally let her investigate the apartment above the garage. She led Nipper and Dennis up the stairs and the three of them sniffed around. The sofa bed was closed up neatly. Dozens of books about everything from ancient weapons to scuba diving filled one tall bookcase. There were also a lot of books about travel and languages. The two wooden crates Uncle Paul carried to the flea market each Saturday were full of his usual collections. Samantha and Nipper sifted through the stacks of license plates and brochures. They recognized most of it. Uncle Paul had shown it to them many times. So guys, if you don't know about flea markets, it's kind of like a big garage sale where everybody is there in one place. If you've ever been to the Tinkerbury Swap Meet, same idea. Um, or if everybody has, like everybody in their block on your street is having a garage sale at the same time, the flea market is usually a place where people go to sell stuff, just stuff that they have to sell in one spot. Samantha inspected her uncle's prized trophy, which rested on a coffee table in the middle of the room. Two years earlier, Uncle Paul had taken a trip to Washington, D.C., and won second place in a hula hoop contest by keeping his hoop going for 22 hours. The winner was a trained monkey that twirled its hips for 22 hours and five minutes. Some people thought Uncle Paul should have claimed victory and demanded the first place trophy. The competition was only supposed to be open to humans, but he seemed quite happy with second place, as if it were his first choice. Dennis sniffed the second grade trophy, second place trophy. He licked it a few times and trotted away. Samantha and Nipper noticed a piece of paper pinned to the wall opposite the windows. 
I hope your dad makes a lot of waffles for you. Samantha examined the note up close. What could this possibly mean, she said. It means that dad's going to have to step up and become the new breakfast maker, said Nipper. Both kids stared at the note. They read the first letter of each word. They read it backwards. They read it forward. They looked for numbers hidden somewhere on the page that might reveal a secret code. Nope. There was nothing they could make of the odd message. Samantha and Nipper spent the rest of the afternoon searching the apartment, but they couldn't find any clues. Uncle Paul hadn't left a phone number or in an address anywhere. There was nothing special or mysterious hidden behind the sofa or under the rug. Just the note on the wall. That evening, Samantha's parents called everyone into the kitchen for a family meeting. Join us here, you three, asked, said their dad, who sat next to their mother at the table. He held what looked to be a handwritten letter in one hand. In his other hand, he held one of the experimental lighting gadgets he often brought home from work. When you told me about the note you found in Uncle Paul's apartment, I decided to look around the kitchen, their mother said. Your father's been struggling to make oatmeal and toast all week, so he never went near the waffle iron. It turns out this letter was hidden under it the whole time. It seemed like an unwise electrical decision, said their father. Let's adjust the color balance of the light. He tilted the page and the glowing self-powered and the glowing self-powered bulb at different angles. Sorry guys, my itchy eyes today. We really should view this with a high candle power light source and the most accurate shade of, Mrs. Spinner lifted the letter from her husband's fingers and began to read it out loud. Dear Buffy, Sam, and Nipper, by the time you read this, I'll be gone. But don't think I haven't loved getting to know all three of you. I'm sure by now your parents spilled the beans that I'm an explorer and one of the very few people who knew know about the super secret. I don't believe this one bit, Buffy interrupted. What a bunch of hooey, added Nipper. Mrs. Spinner pointed two fingers at Buffy and Nipper and made eye contact. As a veterinarian, she had had a lot of experience getting ancient, anxious chinchillas and chameleons to keep still while she bandaged their toes or unpeanut buttered their tails. Getting children to settle down came easily to her. Samantha waited patiently. Now, where was I? Their mom asked and continued reading. You kids are probably thinking that this is all a bunch of hooey, but it's a big secret I've kept for a long time. For my safety, for your parents' safety, and for your safety too. The letter was five pages long, and in it, Uncle Paul explained that he was one of the richest people in the history of the world. He didn't do a very good job of detailing where all the money came from. He mentioned underwater treasure and something about gold bars. The story was confusing. Samantha sat quietly. Sorry guys, I'm checking our timer. Samantha sat quietly as her mother read page after page. Uncle Paul ended by repeating how much he loved his nieces and nephew and saying that he didn't want them to be sad that he was gone. Don't start feeling too bad, kids, their mother read, because it's time for the grown-ups to break out some big presents. The kids all stopped breathing for a second. They sat at the table in silence. Nipper looked at Samantha. Samantha glanced sideways at Buffy. Buffy used her compact to inspect her lipstick, but she was really looking at her brother and sister in the tiny mirror. All three of the Spinner children were trying to play it cool, pretending they hadn't heard the words, big presence. Mrs. Spinner sat down the letter and handed Buffy an envelope. Eagerly, Buffy tore it open. Inside, she found a check made out to her for $2,400,000,000. A note was attached to it with a paperclip. Have fun shopping, Uncle Paul. Mrs. Spinner looked at her husband. Where did this money come from? She asked, not really expecting him to know. Mr. Spinner shrugged. I didn't think Paul had a job, he said, as he handed a folder to Nipper. Nipper opened it to find a packet of papers. He read the top sheet. It was the deed to Yankee Stadium. The deed means you own the building. All the baseball players' contracts were attached to the deed with a binder clip. Nipper closed the folder to read the note that was taped to the front. Don't miss opening day, Uncle Paul. That might be a warning not to lose these, Nipper, Mrs. Spinner said, tapping the folder. Yeah, like that old superhero comic book you fed to the birds, said Buffy, and everything else Uncle Paul gives you. 
I didn't feed it to anyone, said Nipper. A pigeon flew away with it while I was tying my shoe. Uncle Paul always says if nobody lost anything, nothing would be valuable, Samantha reminded her family. She had waited patiently. Now it was her turn. For a moment, her parents glanced at each other without saying anything. Then her dad reached under the table and lifted up a red umbrella. He handed, handed it to her quietly. It was old and worn. A papered tag dangled from the wooden handle. The tag had a message, too. Watch out for the rain, Uncle Paul. Samantha stared at the umbrella. Her uncle had given her an umbrella. A rusty, old umbrella. Don't worry, said Mrs. Spinner. I'm pretty sure we can figure out how all this crazy mixed up stuff fits together. Samantha was pretty sure of one thing already. It wasn't fair. It really wasn't fair. In her heart, she knew that if anyone ever wrote a book about her life, the title of chapter two would be, It Wasn't Fair. And the title of chapter two is, It Wasn't Fair but we have to stop for now, which also is not quite fair. Because I would love to keep reading all afternoon. So my third grade friends, I will send this video along and then I will make a couple more and we'll go through a couple of chapters every time I send one and you can find it on the YouTube's um, channel. And there is a third grade playlist where it will all be lined up in order. Every time I read, I'll add it there and you can find it. So I will see you again soon. And maybe we'll figure out this mystery together. I love mysteries. Bye.